Right, good morning everybody. Um, just while people are joining, I will give a few words of introduction. Um, welcome to day three, the final day of the CCUS 2021 conference. I hope you're all enjoying the conference so far, and I hope you're looking forward to another day of interesting sessions and discussions. Um, so just a few bits of housekeeping before we get going. All the sessions in the conference are being recorded and all the recordings are available to watch on Hoover for um, six months after the conference. So you can watch them here and they will also be uploaded to the CCSA's Vimeo page if you want to watch them there. Um, for this session, we will be taking questions after the presentation. So do please post your questions in the Q&A part of Hoover in the session, not in the chat if possible. Uh, and once our speaker has finished, we will then move on to discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session, Professor Mercedes Mabrota Vela, who is the champion and director of the UK's Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, also called IDRIC. So IDRIC was launched earlier this year um, with a £20 million fund, and IDRIC is part of the wider UK Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge process, which is being led by UK Research and Innovation. So I'll let Mercedes tell you more about the centre itself and what it does, um, but just to give you a bit of a biography of Mercedes herself. So uh, obviously, as I said, she's the champion and director of IDRIC, um, which is focused on accelerating the decarbonisation of industrial clusters. Mercedes is also the associate principal of global sustainability at Harriet Watt University, overseeing the environmental sustainability effort across global campuses and working with partners to achieve global carbon reduction targets. Her internationally recognized track record covers energy systems, CCUS, integration of hydrogen technologies and low carbon fuels. She has over 550 publications, including the editor of four books and holds leading positions in professional societies, editorial boards and has received numerous international prizes and awards. So with that Mercedes, over to you for your presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Judith. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, this really terrifying moment of uh, just making sure that I can share my slides, but we did try this morning and everything seemed to work. Um, okay, so I'm gonna assume you all can see my slides because otherwise I guess uh, Judith uh, will let me know otherwise. So well, um, so good morning, everybody. And um, thank you for joining at maybe this early time of the day, depending on where you are, or maybe late in the afternoon. Uh, so maybe I guess I should say good day, uh, wherever you are. Um, as uh, Judith said, I want to do today, over the next um, 20 minutes, is giving you an introduction to IDRIC, the Industrial Decarbonization Research and Innovation Center, that as Judith also said, uh, we were uh, officially um, announced and launched earlier on this year. Uh, so a lot of what you're gonna see are things that we have already getting off the ground, but there are a lot more, a lot more exciting activities that we'll be doing very, very soon. So let me see if I can pass the slides. Okay, here we are, perfect. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to set a little bit the, the context of why we are doing this, and I realize many of the attendees know very well of this, but just to make sure that they, we all are on a common foot here. Um, so as you know, the UK has set a net zero target for the whole of the UK, and in the case of, of Scotland, it's actually a bit earlier than the rest of the UK, but we are, we are looking at this 2050, 2045. Now, if we go back to uh, May 2019, uh, the Climate Change Committee, and you see that on the left-hand side of your screen, um, the picture on the top, or the diagram on the top, is a, it's a really very powerful because what this diagram tells us is that we can actually decrease our UK greenhouse emissions, but at the same time, we still can increase our GDPs. And you can see there is, there is a really huge difference going from the 1990s to the end of the 2018, we, can have, we have increased our GDP by close to 80% and we decreased our emissions in the order of around 40%, a bit more than that. Now, um, this is a really powerful message. It's, it's really encouraging, but we need to really dig a little bit deeper here. And what you see on the slide on the bottom is that a reduction that we have seen on our CO2 emissions has been mainly due to electrification and mainly to renewables, sorry, I should say, uh, getting into uh, power generation or electricity generation. 
And that's very clear on that diagram. And there are other sectors, uh, particularly around the manufacturing, or even sectors like aviation, shipping, transport, that have not decreased as much. And again, that's a really powerful message because what this is telling us is that we have done a huge progress towards our net zero target. But also, if you allow me to say this, and what we have been doing up to now is the relatively low hanging fruit. Um, what we have to do ahead of us is even more challenging, and that's why it's important we work together. And we have centers like IDRIC to help us to really realize that ambition. The diagram that you have on the right hand side is the six carbon budget uh, that was published at the end of uh, last year, 2020, for the UK. And as you can see in there, let me see if I can move this up the way. Perfect. Maybe you didn't see it in your screen. But what you can see in there is that there is a huge different range of technologies that we are going to have to use and deploy at the scale uh, to be able to take down uh, CO2 emissions from the manufacturing sector. And if I can just pick obviously on, on the obvious because of the, the conference today, you can see CCS, uh, you can see BEX, uh, you can see hydrogen. And let's not forget that depending on the hydrogen, depending on the color, you are going to need a CCS as well. But all those technologies are going to be really important to actually bring down as close as we can to zero our emissions from the manufacturing or the construction sector. And this is a, something I want to reinforce that it's a portfolio of technologies that we need to develop and solutions that we need to bring to market. And again, this is what Idric is playing. So what challenges do we have for these energy intensive industries? Um, on the left hand side, what you have there is a map of uh, different uh, regional differences, as it says. Um, and as you would expect, if you are looking in terms of uh, China, that's going to be dominated more by non-metallic minerals. So more cement, if you want. If you are looking then in cases like Europe or US, there is a slightly different distribution. But regardless of the type of sector or subsector you are within these energy intensive industries, the challenges that you have are emissions are from processed feedstock, not just from the fuel, as many of you know, but the process themselves, they actually emit CO2. We are already dealing with highly integrated process. And most of these processes are operating at high temperature. And then we also have to consider that these plants that they already operate in have a existing lifetimes. And let's not forget the last two points in there. Uh, generally, what we are producing are low cost commodity products. And last but certainly not least, we are operating on a global market. And this is a point that we need to consider because what we are trying to do here with industrial decarbonization is actually attracting more investment and make our sectors more competitive. This is not about driving manufacturing sectors overseas, it is rather the opposite. So for those of you who follow this space closely, um, you will know that in March uh, this year, the UK published the UK Industrial Decarbonization Strategy. And as any strategy, you have a timeline and it's a journey that you, you are actually embarking here. So if we look at the end of the journey, that will be that 2050, is when we have these uh, net zero um, emissions for the whole of the UK. And if we bring that a little bit forward on the 2040s, uh, the ambition here is the world's first net zero industrial cluster. Going backwards a little bit closer, uh, the 2030s, uh, two carbon capture clusters, the 2020s, two carbon, two, carbon two carbon capture clusters operating. And it will bring it all to nowadays, to 2021. Uh, what we have there is the industrial clusters receive funding for engineering studies and as part of that also, IDRIC uh, received funding. So as you can see, a very clear trajectory, what we are doing now in the 2021 to be able to achieve our ambitions for the 2020s, 30s, and 40s. And as part of that, um, again, um, my role today is uh, introducing you IDRIC for those of you not familiar with, and the key role of IDRIC in terms of providing the research and the innovation underpinning quite a lot of the, the deployment of the technologies that we'll be doing and we are already doing now. So let me talk in general about the industrial decarbonization challenge. Um, as uh, Judy mentioned at the beginning, this is a program funded by the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, ISCF, and actually contains uh, three elements. And I think it is very important to recognize how these three elements or the strands work together. There is an industrial demonstrators and set infrastructure. Uh, there is a cluster decarbonization roadmaps, or also known as cluster plans. And there is the industrial decarbonization research and innovation center, known as ITRIC. All these three strands 
we are actually working on what is called phase two, and it's really the, the development, or sorry, the deployment and delivery of the activities that were planned in phase one. In terms of the sectors that we cover, and uh, you can see there on the right hand side, um, these industrial clusters are important because they cover a wide range of sectors. You can see there from chemicals, glass, paper, cement, oil refining, glass, steel. But I think what is also very important is in terms of how they underpin a lot of the manufacturing sector of our economy. And let's not forget, as I like to say sometimes, that even when you look at the deployment of renewables and let's say windmills, um, they need a massive amounts of steel and concrete to actually deploy our renewables. So let's, let's not forget that argument as well. And for those of you familiar with the, with the UK environment, uh, you also know that the, um, last year it was published the 10 point plan and also last year we saw the energy white paper about pioneering sorry powering uh, for a net zero future i'm not going to read all the text in there but basically reinforce the points of uh, renewable energy ccus hydrogen and how all these things are going to be happening around these clusters of activity um, hydrogen is going to be particularly important as well and we have also funds that we have seen coming from the UK government around one billion pounds um, for CCUS industrial clusters and also the net zero hydrogen fund as well for low carbon hydrogen production. So you see a lot of these different activities are coming together and we are looking at the multiple technologies and, and solutions to be deployed at the scale that we need. Moving to my next slide. Okay, here we are. Um, I, I want to um, also bring here the point uh, from the UK hydrogen strategy. Uh, this was published in August uh, this year, the first um, ever um, UK hydrogen strategy. And it has a twin track approach here, uh, looking at different colors of hydrogen. But the point I want to reinforce here is actually what is written on the, on the right hand side there on those boxes. And is that industrial clusters are significant potential demand centers for low carbon hydrogen. So again, we need to start this journey. We have already started the journey of decarbonization of industries and the industrial clusters are really the right place to do it. The reason for that also, if you look from the point of view of hydrogen is because unlocking the demand in these clusters where there is already demand can help us to scale up the hydrogen economy. And also it can help us as well in terms of looking at how UK hydrogen networks may be built uh, between uh, different clusters across the UK. And the other very important point as well is by stimulating and by really creating and developing these demand centers for low carbon hydrogen. What we are doing is also we are anchoring a production that will actually decarbonize other sectors across the UK. And again, um, I want to bring the point of uh, how critical will be research and innovation in terms of underpinning, uh, not just CCUS as is the focus of this conference, but also hydrogen and particularly hydrogen that depends on CCS to be able to be considered low carbon hydrogen. So the role of IDRIC, um, delivering solutions, um, as already mentioned, to accelerate the decarbonization of the industrial clusters, because although we have achieved quite a lot and we are doing significant progress and we are following the right track, we need to do more. Um, and that's where the industrial decarbonization challenge with all the three elements is really key in terms of helping the UK to realize the ambition. There are three main pillars, um, if you want, uh, that we are looking um, as part of Hydric. Uh, one of them is collaborations at the scale and pace. And this is particularly important to make sure that we do meet targets. And also to be, um, to be sure that we do this in an inclusive manner, uh, to do this in a just transition way as well. And, and we don't leave anybody behind as we transition um, to these uh, low carbon or net zero industrial clusters. If you look on the left hand side, what you have there is actually a systems integration. And, and this is really important because what we are looking here is just not a technology. Um, I'm not saying the technologies are not important. Absolutely they are, and we need to deploy them. But when we think about deploying technologies, they have to be integrated with a solution approach. It has to be integrated in a system. And that means that you need the technology, but you also need the policy frameworks as well as the right business models. And this is really the approach from Idric. We are doing a whole systems approach at the right scale, at the cluster size scale. There are other models that have been looking at the UK as a whole systems, 
And there are other approaches that are looking more centered into specific sectors or at the plant level. Idric does this at the cluster regional level. And very importantly, of course, is that we have the skills fit for the future. The energy transition that we see is not just an energy transition, it's also a skills transition. And we need to make sure that we will be able to have these skills fit for the future. And IDRIC is also working in that space. So I mentioned collaborations at the scale and pace. So, so what do I mean by this? Um, we are um, in a total of 142 partners. Um, I would say that um, half of those are actually industrial partners. You can see the breakdown on the bottom of that slide. And there are also 23 research organizations, 35 associations, NGOs, and then 10 uh, policymakers and government bodies. And if you look at the map on the left-hand side, what you have there is the main um, the clusters we are working with, starting in Scotland, the Grangemouth, also with Aberdeen as well. There is a, a connection there that is maybe not that clearly shown in the map. And uh, we have also worked, we also work with a cluster on this side, the Humber cluster, Southampton, uh, South Wales, the Black Country, that is part of the Industrial Decarbonization Challenge, uh, one of the cluster plans. And as I said before, uh, ending up in, in Scotland with the Grangemouth Aberdeen cluster there. What is important in terms of the activities that we do, uh, not just for IDRIC, but I would say across all the industrial decarbonization challenge, is that we look in terms of the impact of our activities. And that impact can be translated in terms of the activities where we will reduce costs or reduce the risk of a particular technology or the timeline for that technology to come to market. And obviously we have to reduce emissions because this is about the net zero targets. But very importantly as well, um, I would like to add here and, and I have mentioned before, is really not just looking only at the technology approach just on its own. It's also looking at considering how we have these economic and policy aspects and have to be integrated in a whole systems approach from the very beginning. And this is really part of what we do and the ethos driving our research and innovation program in ITRIC. So in terms of technology, um, Again, going back to uh, what I mentioned before, the industrial decarbonization strategy uh, published, as I said, in March this year. Again, it gives us um, a roadmap of, of what's happening on technologies. And what you can see there is there are um, already what we call these low regret actions in the 2020s. A very important strand of the industrial decarbonization challenge is actually the deployment infrastructure projects. Um, and there is a list of those um, available on, on the website of FITRIC and also available on the website through UKRI. But these are the projects that are already being deployed. Um, what we also need to consider is what is going to happen post 2020s. What technologies we need to make sure that we can deploy or we can increase the wider deployment of these 2020s technologies. And here is where there is a bit more of an uncertainty in terms of the mix of these technologies, as it says on that map. And what I want to highlight is if you look in terms of um, that uh, red rectangle there, that icon, that light bulb moment, what that actually um, indicates is the milestones which require developments in innovation. And again, this is where IDRIC um, working very closely with the other two elements of the industrial decarbonization challenge is making sure that we have, or we are able to develop, demonstrate and reduce the cost of industrial decarbonization. And there are a raft of technologies that we are working on, and I will mention very briefly how we are structuring our research and innovation program. What is really critical here as well, looking at this graph, is that things need to happen now in the 2020s. So although I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, our targets uh, for the UK are 2040, 2045, 2050, 2045 for Scotland, uh, things need to happen now. The 2020s is the decade of action for us to make sure that we build the infrastructure with the technology so that moving forward, we can build on those foundations. And this is really how we have to structure the research and innovation program in ITRIC, making sure that from the set goal, we identify, direct, and coordinate research. We facilitate the industry alignment. It's challenge-led research, what we are doing here. And it's not only challenge-led research from the beginning, is also continuously working with the clusters to make sure that we can enable the implementation and the impact of our activities. 
And based on this principle, um, or these principles there on the left-hand side, uh, what we have is um, working through um, all of uh, 2020 in a series of a number of different approaches, uh, bottom-up and top-down, uh, we developed this um, multidisciplinary integrated program, so or MIPS, MIP for short. And as you can see there, they include from a system planning, infrastructure, operating, these net zero industrial clusters, scale-up opportunities, and also we have um, a series of uh, programs integrated or focusing a bit more on technologies around energy vector, CCUS, hydrogen, negative emission technologies or greenhouse gas removals, GGRs as you prefer. And it's an integration around the policy, the knowledge exchange and the skills. I would like to highlight here that although there is, for instance, a program clearly labeled as CCUS, and you have that around the middle of that table there, there are CCUS activities in many of our other projects. When we are looking at hydrogen, for instance, we also are considering CCS. And equally, one cannot plan really a net zero industrial cluster or infrastructure operating without considering CCS over hydrogen technologies. So all these technologies are taking a multifaceted approach, all these programs from focus on a technology with the whole systems to actually a technology being part of a much broader solution and integration of technologies. Again, if you look at that, um, Blue box on the bottom is really this whole systems approach uh, that we are using at the right scale of the clusters. And one of my last slides here is around the skills. Um, I did uh, mention at the beginning, um, this is one of the three pillars, making sure that uh, we future proofing the skills. And it's a wide range of uh, different activities that uh, we are developing. We want to understand uh, what this really means in terms of a skills needs assessment. Uh, for the core and the supply chains for these clusters to decarbonize and working very closely with them as they develop their cluster plans. I think it's important we develop framework for competencies, uh, particularly for um, relatively new and emerging technologies like hydrogen, uh, and we can really put these ones in place. Uh, we are keen on understanding uh, the provision for training and skills that is needed to the health industry. Uh, this is uh, both ways uh, from the point of view of recovering, um, from uh, COVID and, and lockdown, and also emerging much stronger than when we left. And within this, um, there is also an element that we are investigating around knowledge and skills transfer, particularly from other energy sectors, let's say from oil and gas, into other emerging industries like CCUS and hydrogen. And then for those of you who have maybe read some of the um, European um, publications as well, in terms of the European transition, energy transition, um, there is going to be a, an overall increase of five to six million jobs across Europe when you are looking at jobs that are focused around this low carbon or energy transition. So in conclusion, uh, we are building the industrial clusters of tomorrow. Um, I hope some of the messages that I um, transfer over to you that I was able to, to put on, on, on your minds um, is about the, the urgency of the message and, and how important it is that we work together and scale. Uh, so we can do this for economic recovery. But as I said at the beginning, this is really to make sure that we keep our industry and we actually attract inward investment. Uh, the role of innovation is going to be key. Um, I didn't touch on this before, but uh, if you read the International Energy Agency, the road to net zero, it was very clear as well, um, the level of investment and innovation will have to be raised if we are to meet our net zero targets globally. A systems approach is the right approach uh, because we have to provide these solutions at the scale. Growing our skills together, sharing the knowledge, and then together all these putting these pathways to achieve a net zero, the transition to net zero. And I'm gonna close here, uh, this is our contact details, either you can contact me or contact the central team at info at edric.org. Please visit our website uh, where you will be able to have a look at the full list of the, what we call the first wave of research and innovation projects. And also we'd like to discuss with you some ideas, opportunities, where we could be looking at the future uh, research and innovation projects. And of course, very keen on continue building strategic partnerships. So that's all I wanted to share. Um, I want to thank uh, CCSA very much for the opportunity to present IDRIC today and, and look forward to, to the questions. So thanks very much everybody and, and thanks for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Mercedes. That was a really fascinating presentation. It's really good to hear about the work of IDRIC and the projects and also how this all fits in with the wider industrial decarbonisation challenge work. Um, I'm going to start off discussion. We've got quite a few questions coming through and probably got about 10 minutes or so. Um, so yesterday we heard quite a lot, obviously, about clusters and obviously there's a cluster sequencing process competition going on at the moment. Um, but yesterday we had a session about those uh, facilities and uh, projects that are outside of clusters in remote locations and are struggling to link into clusters. How do we uh, bring them into the process? Uh, you know, how does IDRIC help to bring them into the process and link up to transport and storage infrastructure and ensure that they can also meet their decarbonisation targets? Thanks. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very good question. So uh, when we look at the industrial emissions in the UK, 53% um, of those emissions come from industrial clusters. So you're absolutely right that we still have 47% coming from areas, dispersed sites, that they are not um, clusters. Uh, and, and this is really where IDRIC uh, plays a key role because uh, one of the activities that we have, I didn't have time to touch on that today, but it's really around the knowledge exchange and the cross fertilization of ideas. Um, one point I would like to make here is that when we talk about the clusters, um, they are in a variety of locations, as you saw from the map, but they also cover a wide range of sectors. There are not two clusters the same. So we have some clusters that are maybe chemical sectors or clusters that may be more dominated by, let's say, steel. So the solutions coming out from those clusters, they're not gonna be just one only for a cluster, they're actually gonna be a myriad of solutions. And with the right knowledge exchange and cross fertilization of ideas with IDRIC, we will be able to take these best practices outside the clusters to these sites. Okay, good. No, thanks. That's really uh, useful to know. I think the dispersed sites uh, that were on yesterday would probably appreciate that. Um, so, got a question here about CCUS and hydrogen. I think lots of discussion also throughout the conference on this topic and I think we've got a session later actually uh, on hydrogen with one of our sponsors. So um, the question is what are the largest synergies between CCUS and hydrogen and where could they be competitors in the market? Yeah. So I, I think in this space what we need to look going back to one of my first slides where I saw how important are these two technologies to decarbonize the clusters. Uh, and, and I don't see them as competitors. I think one thing we need to consider is that for us to decarbonize, and this is not just the clusters, it's really across everything, um, we need the toolbox of different technologies. And, and these technologies, um, in some cases, they will help each other because they will maybe share some infrastructure. And, and we know that depending on the color of hydrogen, you are gonna need CCS. If, if it is going to be a low carbon hydrogen. So what the, the way I like to see is that there are different options and there are synergies and opportunities, particularly around the clusters, because they are already sharing infrastructure. They already have the skills uh, that could be transferred or already are available for this type of, uh, of technologies. So I think it's just about considering how we need all these technologies that in some cases may be a technology that is better suited than other, depending on the sector, or, it, or it maybe even depending on the geography and the geology that you have and where your locations, where your facility is located. So I don't like to say they're competitors. I think we need them all. And there are clear synergies uh, in terms of how we deploy them in the clusters. Yeah, I think a, a soundbite from yesterday that I was quite enjoying, um, actually in the dispersed site session was about this and not either or. Absolutely. Which I thought was a quite a good little soundbite. I think there's definitely, Absolutely. I mean, that cuts across everything, doesn't it? You know, these are sectors that we all have to work together, um, the sectors that CCS applies to, but also the other sectors um, that are reaching low carbon, so renewables, hydrogen, um, you know, all of these other industrial low carbon mm. technologies. Yes. And, and there are, sorry, Judith, if I may, um, there is also, as part I mentioned before, that the industrial decarbonization challenge has a, a strand of deployment infrastructure projects, and those there, they cover a range of uh, CCUS and hydrogen, and in some cases, it's the integration of those ones as well. So, so that's really within the spirit as well of the industrial decarbonization challenge. I think absolutely, this is going to be really important as we go forward. I think we were all really excited about the, the hydrogen strategy, so I think collaboration and coordination is going to be really key now. Um, another theme that's been picked up in the questions is about public engagement. So again, we've had a lot of discussion on public engagement. We had a session on this on Tuesday on the first day. Um, so I think one attendee was asking a question as to whether IDRIC will have a strand on public engagement or social research and how IDRIC links to others who work on public engagement. 
Thank you. And I do realize maybe that was not clear from, from my presentation, so that, that question is really welcome. Um, the way we are integrating social behavioral policy, we integrate that as part of those uh, programs of work. Um, so even when we talk, for instance, about um, a program of work around CCUS, within that we actually have about public perceptions and accept acceptability as well. And equally, uh, when we are working in terms of uh, the programs to hydrogen or the programs around infrastructure and systems planning. So pretty much every of our programs has a focus on technology, a focus on a social, economic, or maybe policy aspect, depending on what is appropriate for that. Um, we don't have a work package separated where we deal with policy or where we deal with uh, public engagement, because we think the right way to do it is a whole system where all of this is integrated. Um, we have, I should probably say this as well, uh, within, um, if you look at the website of Vitric, you will see that there is a whole range of projects, 40 projects that we have announced, and you will see that there are some that are more focused on social aspects, that they are integrated within this much larger program of activity. We are also talking with the, with the clusters and the roadmaps, because themselves, they also are doing a public engagement activities around their cluster and their deployment projects, and we want to understand the research and innovation needs from the point of view of, of ITREC. And so a couple of ways from doing our own research on social, behavioral, economic, policy, regulatory aspects to working with the clusters and understand where they're going within their public engagement activities. Yeah, no, I think that could be really key. I mean, I think um, lots of discussion about not just the building the wider public awareness and support for CCUS, but also understanding who are the messengers, who are the trusted organizations. Um, and I think IDRIC has a really big role to play here, actually. Um, yes, and it's, so. it's co-creating that dialogue, really. So, so this is, you know, it's not about saying this is what we do. It's really making sure from the set go, we work together, we put together technologies, policymakers, yeah. um, and then we just get them together to co-create a dialogue and, and really that narrative. And, and I think that's really what will make a difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we at the CCSA are obviously trying to think about how to start rolling out kind of that public awareness and support more nationally. Um, so I think, you know, we will definitely be uh, looking to work with IDRIC to, to, to help build that the kind of wider support. Um, moving on to another question, I think there was a, a question about international engagement. So how does IDRIC engage with international partners and what links do you have with other countries to ensure that we can benefit from CCUS technological developments overseas? Thank you. These are all really good questions, you know, and it's one of those things when you have to do a presentation for 20 minutes, you say, oh, gee, something has to, cannot be included there, right? <clears throat> so, so the aspect of the international, um, I did not, did not include yourself because yeah, the, the time that we have to try to cover everything. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with Hedrick, uh, and this was already uh, back in, in 2020, uh, we already have engaged with uh, similar organizations say uh, overseas, um, particularly in Norway and the Netherlands and, and Canada. Um, and we are particularly keen on working uh, with organizations in um, Australia, actually, we have started discussions as well, that they are looking at this uh, whole systems cluster um, type of uh, angle or approach here. Um, we also, as part of a COP26 as well, just a few weeks away in Glasgow, uh, we are part of the International Centre Summit, and, and IDRIC is one of the international centres that will be participating there and working with other similar centres, uh, in some cases more with a focus on a technology or with a focus in a, in a particular geographical area of the world, um, and we'll be exchanging notes and, and learning and understanding from each other. So absolutely it's key that when we look at this, we don't just look you know, only within the context of the UK, but we see how we can learn and actually get close links internationally. And that's something we started working on last year um, and with COP26 as well, we'll give it a big push. Great, thank you. No, that's, that's really good to know. I think we all need to benefit from developments and collaboration all over the world. So we ensure that we move forward in a timely fashion. I guess COP26 is probably going to be um, shining a spotlight on that to say the least. <laughs> Um, so I think that's probably all we have time for right now. Um, thank you everyone for all of your questions. They were really great. Um, thank you for Ms. to Mercedes for answering them. Uh, and uh, I would just like to say, if you haven't got around to getting your question answered, there is a community board function on Hoover on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, you can post questions there and start discussion and keep discussion going. So already lots of questions on there. Um, and we'll also uh, make sure if Mercedes, if she has time, 
can also dive into that community section and hopefully try and answer some questions. But obviously do everyone take a look at um, Idric's website, um, which is a, a great way to find out more about the center and how you might be able to get involved. So just to flag a couple of upcoming sessions for the rest of the day. So you've got a bit of a break now until 9.30. Um, the next session at 9.30 is CCUS through an economic lens. Um, this is a session focusing on jobs and growth and skills um, and leveling up and just transition. So uh, also looking to be a really interesting session. Then at 10.45, we've got the last of our sponsored sessions, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which is on the UK's hydrogen strategy um, and how we can deliver that strategy and uh, the synergies with CCUS. Um, so with that, thank you once again to everyone for joining and thank you so much to Mercedes for giving us an introduction to Idric. That was um, really excellent. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.